Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 26th of February 2022. The articles which we are going to discuss today have been displayed on this screen. And let us now begin the discussion. So the first article which we have taken appears on page number 1 as well as on 8. Surprise enemy with Indian arms, says PM, where Modi calls for vibrant defence industry which is based and rooted in our country. So Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday stressed the importance of increasing customization and uniqueness of defence systems for having a surprise element over the adversaries. At the same time, he also emphasised the indigenization of defence technology in India. Indigenization of defense technology means defense equipments, weapons, instruments conceptualized in India, designed in India and made or manufactured in our country. So this indigenization is not only important in terms of economy but it also gives a lot of strategic autonomy to India's foreign policy. So we are going to begin the analysis by first understanding the mapping of this particular topic with the UPSC syllabus. And as you can see Achievement of Indians in science and technology, indigenization of technology and developing new technology is a part of your syllabus in GS paper 3. And so in this regard, we are going to discuss four key things. Why there is a need for indigenization? What are the issues with indigenization? What are the steps that have been taken for indigenization? And the draft defense and export promotion policy which was released just last year. And so let us now begin the discussion by first understanding why is there a need to indigenize and this goes for any technology, this goes for any sector but specifically for the defense sector. Why indigenization of defense technology is absolutely important for maintaining India's integrity and sovereignty. Starting with India's second largest arm importer. If you take all the countries which import arms and ammunitions from foreign countries, India stands second in the list. So very valuable foreign exchange reserve has to be divested, has to be spent while acquiring these arms and ammunitions. Apart from running down our foreign exchange reserve, it also impacts our trade deficit. So by possessing a sound defense sector indigenously, India can not only reduce its dependence on foreign imports, but also it gives us an opportunity to convert this trade deficit into surplus. So this is just economy, but it also has a strategic point of view. It also has a security implications. By not possessing domestic capability to produce arms and ammunition makes India perpetually dependent on other countries. Because once you start importing a lot of arms and ammunition from foreign countries, first, it does not give you an opportunity to develop your own domestic base and second, you are perpetually dependent for their parts, for their servicing, for their maintenance on the source countries. And this subjects India to a lot of strategic constraints. So for example, if you have imported significant amount of fighter jets from France, it is mandatory for India now to maintain cordial relation with France because if tomorrow France says that we are not going to service our Rafale jets, then India cannot do anything because there is no other supplier of the parts of this very specific and specialized fighter jet. Apart from that, having a domestic capability to develop such a high-tech machinery is going to employ a lot of people not just in primary but secondary at tertiary level as well. And it will definitely lead to overall industrial growth. Because you need to understand a concept of propulsive industry. And defense sector is a propulsive industry. So it's just not like a very minor industry which is going to serve its own purpose. Once a defense project is established, a lot of other industries are needed to support or to cater to the defense industry. And hence it has a multiplier effect. So propulsive industries are those which lead to generation of subsidiary industries along or around their areas. So you can understand that having a sound domestic base of manufacturing in defense technology is not only important for economic purposes but also very very crucial for India's strategic independence or autonomy. 
because then indian foreign policies would not be contingent upon the policies of major developed countries so for example right now west is in fight or in war with russia not directly but indirectly now india imports arms not just from russia but also from us and france which is stopping india from taking any sides in this particular conflict for example in last 3 to 4 years india is having a very hard time in convincing usa that import of s400 missile defense systems from russia should not be put under sanction list of america so these kinds of problems shall not arise if india has defense domestic production or sound domestic defense manufacturing capabilities so before going forward let us now first understand what are the pillars of defense capabilities so you need to understand that there are four stakeholders to defense manufacturing ecosystem the first one is the end user which is the overall purpose of designing a defense equipment which are armed forces they are the people who are ultimately going to use these weapons then next comes designing which is the conceptualization of the weapons for which we have drdo then after an equipment has been designed or conceptualized that design once approved is handed over to the manufacturer or the makers which are basically either public sector undertaking companies or the private sector undertakings and then last but not the least pillar of defense capability is academia where all the front line research goes on if we talk about the four components the last one which is academia is the weakest link in our country because the human resource capabilities in developed countries which deal with the cutting edge research is generally located in top institutions like harvard stanford mit caltech whereas in our country the cutting edge research is right now going on in drdo and isro and not in our universities and institutes so what are the challenges which india's defense manufacturing capabilities are facing the first and foremost is the massive delays in not just the designing and manufacturing but also in the acquisition processes and the main reason behind that is the functioning of armed forces which are the users the designers which is drdo and the makers which are psus work in silos there is hardly any interaction or collaboration so to say in between or among these four pillars and because of this when a need is felt by an armed forces or component of armed forces about a new equipment or a weapon or a technology it is usually 5 to 10 years of delay when that need is communicated to drdo then drdo comes up with a design which is then delayed by almost 5 to 7 years in communication to psus and so you can see once a need is felt at the ground level and border areas it is already 20 25 years time when the weapon is made by the public sector undertakings when we talk about delay in the designing and in the making stage we can clearly see that defense technology in india is public sector driven and so all the issues which plague public sector undertakings in all the sectors in our country also plagues the defense sector as well now because of the government policies there is still no liberalization in defense manufacturing because of which all the major players are public sector undertakings which then clearly reflects in either the final product being substandard or extremely delayed which then renders it useless for the army because by that time the government of india has already gone ahead and acquired a foreign made equipment or a weapon serving the same purpose for which the research was undertaken then comes the issue of lack of critical technology and this is mainly because of lack of funds as well as lack of requisite skills in the human resource in our country and that is mainly because of the neglected fourth pillar of our ecosystem which is academia our premier institutes in technology for example iits and nits do not have a separate stream specializing in defense technology even the funding of the government when it comes to designing of new technology is minimal then there are other issues as well for example long gestation period as all of us can easily understand that these technology require a lot of time to be actually effectual on ground and as we have discussed armed forces usually run out of patience because ultimately they are the one who are going to defend our borders and us and so they push the government to acquire foreign made goods 
which then finally scuttles the defense development program of that particular weapon in our country. And then finally, we have a lot of land acquisition issues, just like all other fields, which have led to delay in a lot of defense development projects in our country. But it's not like government has not taken any initiative or step in this regard. We have a Department of Defense Production in Ministry of Defense taking care of production and designing of new weapons, which manages and runs the ordnance factories, which manufacture a lot of arms and especially the minor arms, but which are mainly on the basis of technology transfer, where an original patent holder of a foreign weapon leases out licenses to manufacture a particular arm to various companies across the world. So it's not like a development of new technology, but production based on already existing technology purchased on license from a foreign vendor. Then we have a lot of defense PSUs, for example, HAL, MDSL. Also recently, government has started issuing licenses to the private sector players for the production of minor arms. So this is mainly as far as the production is concerned. What about designing? And for that, we already have DRDO which is the prime agency responsible for designing and development of state-of-the-art defense technology and one of the few most significant and successful technologies developed by our DRDO are Prithvi missile, Agni missile and Tejas. Then this is not just it. Indian Armed Forces have their in-house design team and the wings which parallelly run the program of designing of new weapons. Because ultimately they are the ones who are going to use it and so they are the most well-placed agencies to understand their own needs and come up with some very rough draft or a very initial basic design which can then be communicated to DRDO for further development. Then in 2020, government notified defense procurement procedure which came up with a lot of categories of defense equipments. For example, made in India, built in India, designed in India. And depending upon the percentage of indigenization, the government gives preference in the acquisition process. Then the government has also come up with a lot of schemes, for example, Make in India, Startup India, IDEX. Then recently, Government of India has also launched this scheme of defense corridors. For example, the latest one being, or the only two being, one in, located in Tamil Nadu and another one located in Uttar Pradesh. So the draft defense procurement policy 2020 is the latest document of the government of India, it is important for us to have a look at that. It aims to achieve a turnover of rupees 1,75,000 crore or $25 billion, including export of around 35,000 crore in aerospace and defense goods and services by 2025. It intends to develop a dynamic, robust and competitive defense industry, including aerospace and naval shipbuilding industry to cater to the needs of armed forces with quality products. It also intends to reduce dependence on imports and take forward Make in India initiatives through domestic design and development. At the same time, it aims to promote export of defense products and become a part of global defense value chains. And finally, it will aim to create an environment that encourages research and development, rewards innovation, creates Indian intellectually property ownerships and promote a robust and self-reliant defense industry. So how does it wants or intends to achieve all of this which we have discussed in the previous slide? So the draft policy clearly lists down six major areas of action. For example, procurement reforms, support to MSMEs and startups, optimizing resource allocation, investment promotion, innovation and R&D, and focusing on DPSUs and ordinance factory board. So let us now begin with procurement reforms. Now we understand that procurement is completely and totally in the hands of the government. And so the government has proposed to publish a negative list. Now what does this mean? So negative list is a list of equipment and if a particular equipment finds its place in the negative list, it cannot be imported, but only domestically manufactured. And so what government has done is that it has laid out a plan of yearly increasing negative list. So for example, let's say, that the government notifies the negative list for 2024 and helicopter is there in 2024 which will mean that 2024 onwards helicopters cannot be imported in India. It can only be manufactured in India and then acquired by the government of India. 
This will not only boost domestic manufacturing but will also act as an assurance to domestic manufacturers who will be assured that there would be a market and government is the biggest market one can have for the production that they are going to now conduct. And so, if the government releases an advanced negative list, the people who are interested in defense technology can look at that list and start their research and development, start their designing, start their production, anticipating the procurement of these items from the government. Because now they don't have to fight or compete against the foreign vendors. All they have to do is to be better than the other domestic players. And the government has specifically mentioned in the draft policy that this list will progressively become longer and longer, which is a great news. At the same time, government also realizes that defense manufacturing and production is a highly specialized and skilled job, which requires a priori estimation of the development times and production lead times, which is basically the minimum amount of leverage in terms of time an agency needs to be able to successfully develop a weapon or an equipment, life cycle costs, as well as maintenance requirements. And so in order to be able to calculate all of these and integrate these into the overall cost, a project management unit has been conceptualized in the draft policy, which will have representation from all the services, which will not only facilitate the overall procurement, but will at the same time also ensure the enforcement of the contracts. Next comes support to MSMEs and startups. Like any other sector, MSMEs or startups form an important part or pillar of defense manufacturing as well. And in this regard, the draft policy proposes two important suggestions. The first is that it proposes component manufacturing by MSMEs immediately once this policy is notified. And from the reading of the draft, it makes us or leads us to believe that the government might make it mandatory for all the components production to be done under MSME sector. Then it proposes an indigenization portal, which would be quite similar to the GEM portal, where all the services are going to list out their demands or their needs. And anyone from the private sector, especially belonging to the MSME sector, will be eligible to contact the services, their project management unit, and propose their idea or the design or the manufactured products. And so it is going to go a long way in addressing the delay in procurement and acquisition process. Then in the draft policy, government has also proposed optimization of resource allocation. So for example, currently all the expenses on acquisition of capital is shown under one head. Now the government is planning to make a distinct budget head for domestic products among all the services. And the government is going to make it mandatory for that particular amount to be spent only on domestic acquisition or the products which have been domestically manufactured. Then in the draft policy, government is actively looking into promotion of investment through ease of doing business. Then in the draft policy, government also mentions of creating a narrow engine complexes which will not only focus on manufacturing of aviation sector equipments like helicopters and jet fighter jets, but also will look into MRO capabilities, which is basically maintenance, repair and overhaul. And if you know, currently in India, there is no MRO services provided by either Boeing or Airbus. All our aircrafts have to go either to Middle East or European countries in order to get them serviced. Then what about the innovation in R&D in which India is pathetically behind? And in the draft policy, government has proposed target missions and it has specified some items only for them. The government is going to run target missions. So these are hypersonic missiles, fifth generation fighter aircraft and transport aircraft. So just like government runs very targeted schemes for let's say public distribution system, for enabling people to construct their own homes through Avas Yojanas, similarly specifically targeted schemes will be run or the missions will be run to manufacture domestically these three highly advanced technologies. And in the draft policy, government specifically mentions lab to lines or concept to implementation scheme. So government is going to lay a lot of emphasis on how and why we can convert the ideas or the designs into functioning models which are effective on ground, which is the basic problem for our country. So these are the highlighting points of draft defense policy, which can be as it is asked in the mains or also in prelims examination. Then the next topic of discussion appears on page number 8, Urban Body Polls in Odisha on March 24. So the State Election Commissioner announced 
elections to urban bodies in Odisha. And now this brings us to a very very important topic which is quite frequented by UPSC in prelims examination and that is about the Panchayati Raj or local governance, especially the 73rd constitutional amendment. And now since there are not a lot of news which can be covered today, we will utilize this opportunity to cover the constitutional provisions related to the 73rd constitutional amendment or the Panchayati Raj system. Before we do that, let us have a look at two questions and these are just two questions but many other questions have been asked. For example, in 2016 UPSC asked, consider the following statements. The minimum age prescribed for any person to be a member of Panchayat is 25 years. A Panchayat reconstituted after premature dissolution continues only for the remainder period. Then in 2011 UPSC asked the Constitution 73rd Amendment Act 1992 which aims at promoting the Panchayati Raj institution in the country, provides for which of the following? Constitution of District Planning Committee, State Election Commissions to conduct all Panchayati elections, Establishment of State Finance Commissions. And now let us go through the discussion from the original source which is the Constitution of India and see that whether these questions could be answered if you had read the Constitution of India. And starting with the very basics and that is which part of the constitution of India deals with the Panchayati Raj system. And if you look at the original PDF and if you scroll down you can see part 1 deals with the union and its territories, part 2 deals with the citizenship, part 3 deals with fundamental rights and similarly if you scroll further down you can see the Panchayats is dealt with in part 9 which starts at article 243 with the definitions and then going further part 9a deals with the municipalities. So, Article 243 first defines the term which will be used in this particular part which means what will be a district, what do you call a Gram Sabha and it is important to know that Gram Sabha means a body consisting of persons registered in the electoral rolls relating to a village comprised within the area of Panchayat at the village level. So, Gram Sabha is an inclusive body which includes everyone whose name appears in the electoral rolls. Then it defines what does it mean by intermediate level, panchayat, panchayat area, population and village. And so a village under part 9 would mean village specified by the governor by public notification. So that can also be framed as one of the options in the prelims examination. Now part 243 is very very important which says a Gram Sabha may exercise such powers and perform such functions at the village level as the legislature of a state may by law provide. And this is one of the biggest problem with the delegation of the powers to the local level because the constitution uses a very important word may and it does not use the word shall. And so that is where the freedom has been given to the state governments to enable the Gram Sabha to exercise function. Then Article 243b deals with the constitution of Panchayats and the constitution mandates that there shall be. And now note here that the word shall has been used. There shall be constituted in every state Panchayat at village, intermediate and district level in accordance with the provisions of this part. As far as Panchayats at intermediate level is concerned, they may not be constituted in state having a population not exceeding 20 lakhs. So all those states which have population less than 20 lakhs may not have intermediate level of Panchayats. They can only do with the village and the district level. But those two are mandatory. Now what about the composition of Panchayats? Then Article 243C deals with composition of Panchayats. That the legislature of a state may by law make provisions with respect to the composition of the Panchayats. But all those laws shall be subject to the provisions of this part. But it puts a condition even there. That the ratio between the population of a territorial area of a Panchayat at any level and the number of seats in such Panchayat to be filled by election shall as far as practicable be same throughout the state. So take any level, let's say take a district level. And so if there is a district 1 which has 100 seats for 1 lakh population, so which means that per seat has around 1000 people and so this particular ratio shall be same in any other district of the same state. And the second important provision of article 243 is that all the seats in a panchayat shall be filled by persons chosen by direct election from territorial constituencies in panchayat area. So this is a very very important provision that all the seats in panchayats shall be filled by persons chosen by direct election from the people. 
and for this purpose for this election the panchayat area shall be divided into smaller constituencies that is very common sensical and again the same rule of ratio shall be followed throughout the state then the third provision says the legislature of a state may by law provide for the representation of and so this provision deals with some other people who may not be directly elected by the people for the representation and who are these people the chairpersons of panchayat at village level at the intermediate level so there are three levels of panchayats in most states we have village level we have intermediate level and then we have district level so the chairpersons of village level might be represented in intermediate level and similarly the chairpersons of panchayats at intermediate level may get a seat at district level it also provides for provisions so that the members of house of people and members of legislative assembly of the state whose constituencies partially or wholly lie in panchayat area may also get representation but all these things are not mandatory only if the state laws provides for such kind of provision only then it can be implemented then similarly not only the members of house of people and members of legislative assembly but also the members of council of states and the members of legislative council of the state can get the representation at the intermediate and the district level but only at the place where they are registered as electors then the question arises and a very important one that how will the chairperson of a panchayat at various level will be elected and so the chairperson of panchayat at village level shall be elected in such a manner as the legislature of a state may by law provide so the constitution does not provides for any fixed format to be followed throughout the country but the chairperson of a panchayat at the intermediate level or district level shall be elected by and from amongst the elected members of the panchayat itself as far as village level is concerned states have the freedom to follow different kinds of formats but for chairperson at intermediate and district level the constitution uses the word shall and hence it is mandatory that all of them shall be elected from and amongst the members themselves then we know that it also provides for reservation of seats for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and that is being done in article 243 d and then it also provides for the reservation of the women then it also talks about duration of panchayats in article 243e and it says every panchayat unless sooner dissolved under any law for the time being in force shall continue for 5 years from the date appointed for its first meeting and no longer and it says that an election to constitute a panchayat shall be completed before the expiry of its duration specified in clause 1 which means before the expiry of the 5 years or before the expiration of a period of 6 months from the date of its dissolution so in a normal course every 5 years you would expect panchayat election but if a panchayat is dissolved before 5 years let's say in 3 and a half years then the next elections have to be conducted within 6 months of the dissolution and then a very important clause for says a panchayat constituted upon the dissolution of a panchayat before the expiration of its duration shall continue only for the remainder of the period for which the dissolved panchayat would have continued so let us understand this with an example if a panchayat is constituted in 2020 and let's say if it is dissolved in 2023 so the normal course would have been till 2025 that is the period of 5 years but if it is dissolved in 2023 which means that the remainder period is 2 years and so when a new panchayat is formed it will continue only for a period of 2 years and that is one of the options which was given in the prelims question which we have shown in the first slide then there are various conditions which have been set by the constitution for the disqualification for the membership of a panchayat so if a person is disqualified for being a member of legislature of the state then that automatically disqualifies her for being the member of panchayat as well and also the state have the power to enact laws to disqualify people and these are constitutional provisions and now comes the most important part that is powers authority and responsibility of the panchayats and again the constitution does the minor tweaking with the word and it uses the word may it says the legislature of a state may by law endow the panchayats with such powers and authority as may be necessary to enable them to function as institutions of self government and this is where the problem lies constitution does not mandates the delegation of power it puts it to the jurisdiction or to the discretion of various states and so 
the states can enact laws to delegate various powers which they have to the local government and what are those preparation of plans for economic development and social justice the implementation of schemes for economic development and social justice as may be interested to them including those in relation to the matters listed in 11th schedule so these are the two powers which can be given to the local governments by the state legislature or by the state government then the constitution also provides for the powers like imposition of taxes or funds by the panchayats and again the state legislature of a state may by law and not shall by law and so the state legislature can pass laws through which they can authorize a panchayat to levy collect and appropriate taxes duties tolls fees as have been provided in their laws they can also assign to a panchayat taxes duties tolls and fee levied and collected by the state government for various purposes they can also provide for making such grants in aid to the panchayats from the consolidated fund of the state and they can also provide for constitution of such funds for crediting all money received respectively by or on behalf of the panchayats and also provide for withdrawal of such monies but if you look at the actual powers which the panchayats possess right now there is a lot of variation in that some states panchayats have a lot of power as far as taxes and duties are concerned but there are some states where panchayats do not have practically any kind then wherever there is a devolution fund there is a finance commission and so just like we have a finance commission provided by article 280 at the central level to enable the to enable the vertical devolution of funds from center to states we have state finance commissions which is provided by article 243i and just like article 280 provides for the constitution of finance commission through president here the governor of a state as soon as may be at the expiration of every fifth year constitute a finance commission to review the financial position of panchayats and to make recommendation to the governor as to the principles which should govern the distribution of various kinds of net proceeds of taxes duties and tolls between the state and the panchayats the principles which will determine the taxes duties and tolls which may be assigned or appropriated by the panchayats principles which will determine the grants in aid to the panchayats from the consolidated fund of the state and also it will suggest the measures which are needed to improve the financial position of the panchayats and then of course governor may refer any other financial matter to the finance commission an important aspect of this particular provision is that there is no fixed criteria as to the qualification and the composition of the finance commission which will be determined by the state legislature by law so the state legislature of a state may by law provide for the composition of the commission the qualifications which shall be requisite for appointment as members thereof and and the manner in which they shall be selected and then what shall be done with that report so the governor shall cause every recommendation made by the commission under this article together with an explanatory memorandum as to action taken thereon to be laid before the legislature of the state so finance commission will recommend something and along with those recommendations an action taken report as to how many recommendations were agreed by the state government how many recommendations were not agreed and if not why not all these things shall be laid before the legislature then as far as auditing of the accounts of panchayat is concerned again the state legislature shall make laws regarding that and then comes that provision because of which we are discussing the whole constitution provision and that is related to elections to the panchayats which is dealt with in article 243k which says the superintendent's direction and control of the preparation of electoral rolls for and the conduct of all elections to panchayat shall be vested in state election commission consisting of a state election commissioner to be appointed by the governor then what are the securities or the guarantees provided to the election commission that is given in clause 2 subject to the provision of any law made by the legislature of a state the conditions of service and tenure of office of the state election commissioner shall be such as the governor may by rule determine but provided that the state election commissioner shall not be removed from his office except in like manner and on the like grounds as a judge of high court so although the states have power to legislate the terms and conditions and tenure of the office of a state election commissioner but his or her removal has been specified by the constitution and that has to be on the grounds and on like manner 
of a judge of a high court and the condition of service of a state election commissioner shall not be varied to his disadvantage after his appointment so these are the securities being given to the state election commissioner so these are the important provisions of part 9 of the constitution of india which deals with panchayat some of the important articles which you should remember from the perspective of both prelims as well as mains examination is article 243b which deals with the constitution of panchayat article 243c which deals with the composition of panchayats article 243d which deals with the reservation of seats then article 243g which deals with the powers authority and responsibility of the panchayats and article 243h which deals with powers to impose taxes and funds by the panchayats and finally article 243k which deals with the elections to the panchayats now whenever you have to quote the deficiencies in our panchayat system you can say one of the deficiency is that constitution does not mandate the delegation of the power as stated in article 243g and h where the constitution uses the word may rather than shall now after having this discussion on the constitutional provision check for yourself whether you were able to solve these two questions which have been asked in the prelims examination or not and let us now move on to the next discussion then this next news of troubled water appears as a column on page number 6 india and sri lanka should find a lasting solution to the issues facing their fisher folk sri lanka being india's one of the closest maritime neighbors it is important for us to cover it from the perspective of gs paper 2 syllabus at the main stage because the line of the syllabus just like the last article says india and its neighborhood relations and whenever we try to analyze india and its neighborhood relations we just don't have to keep ourselves limited to the challenges between the two neighbors we also have to talk about areas of cooperation or in the language of international relation we called convergences so convergences challenges which mean divergences and what could be a way forward through which the countries can resolve their challenges and increase their areas of cooperation so let us now begin the discussion by first understanding the areas of cooperation between india and sri lanka so as far as the areas of cooperation are concerned there are four clear areas which are trade culture development projects and strategic partnerships now to start with the trade sri lanka is one of the india's largest trading partner in sarc india in turn is sri lanka's largest trade partner globally now apart from good trading relations india already has a free trade agreement with sri lanka which was signed in 2000 and right now the two countries are negotiating economic and technological cooperation agreement which would be fta plus now as far as the next dimension of cooperation is concerned culture is something which is very very important in case of india and sri lanka buddhism spread by ashoka in sri lanka is one of the strong pillars connecting both the nations which originated in india and then spread to sri lanka the other important binding link between india and sri lanka as far as religion goes is hinduism not only a significant minority group of tamilians are hindus but also the prominent mention of sri lanka island in the epic of ramayana ensures that a lot of hindus go for pilgrim to the important religious sites mentioned in the epic of ramayana then if we talk about the development aspect of areas of cooperation sri lanka plays a very crucial role in india's development as it provides the facility of trans shipment from the ports like colombo and hamban tota which handle huge cargo that comes to india and the reason is that india has not been able to fully develop a trans shipment port along the southern coast then apart from that india has been carrying out a lot of development projects in sri lanka for example india's housing projects and railway construction in the jaffna or the northeastern part of sri lanka to help the war torn region then the next important area of cooperation is strategic cooperation and if you know you would appreciate that india and sri lanka hold common membership of three important groups sarc bimstec and indian ocean rim association and apart from that sri lanka is also important for india in its ambitions to become net security provider in indian ocean and so pursuing strong ties with sri lanka is an integral part of india's neighborhood first policy but analyzing the events of past 10 to 20 years India and Sri Lanka relationship face very very significant challenges which 
can be categorized into four different groups. One is of course the Chinese factor which is always there whenever we talk about India and its neighborhood relations. Then there is a peculiar case of ethnic issue in Sri Lanka. Then the issues of fishermen and stalled infra projects or inability of the India to complete infrastructural projects or to compete with China as far as construction of novel projects in Sri Lanka is concerned. So let us now have a look at each one of them one by one. So whenever we talk about the challenges and we talk about Chinese influence in Sri Lanka's internal and external matters, there are four important events which we recall. For example, scrapping of Indian infrastructure projects like Colombo East Container Port Terminal at a time when China is increasing its investment in same Colombo Port City. Then recently, Sri Lanka gave approval to Chinese funded Colombo Port City with some autonomy. Apart from that, we already know that China had developed Hamban Tota port, which was later leased to it for a period of 99 years because the Sri Lanka was unable to repay the loans on the debts it had from China. And then Sri Lanka has also endorsed Belt and Road Initiative of China. So these are the factors which clearly indicate a decisive turn which Sri Lanka has taken as far as India and China are concerned. Then apart from the Chinese factor, the next important challenges which India and Sri Lanka face is that of ethnic issue. The long drawn ethnic conflicts and human rights violation of the Tamils have always been a troublesome issue between the two. But even after that, the lack of proper rehabilitation and lack of implementation of the 13th amendment to the constitution of Sri Lanka to the northern Tamil provinces have further strained the ties. Because this was the commitment of Sri Lanka to not just its own people, but also to the Indian government. Then the next set of challenges come from fishermen, because of which we are discussing India-Sri Lanka relations. Sri Lankan fishermen object to Indians using bottom trawlers and fishing illegally along their coast, which often leads to arrests of Indians. Apart from that, the disputed status of the island of Kachatibu is still not resolved and continues to be a problematic issue between India and Sri Lanka. Then the last major sticking point between India and Sri Lanka is the inability of India to get its infrastructural projects concluded and completed within time, be it Jaffna's hybrid energy project or be it Sampur power plant both of which have not been completed and in fact some poor power project has been cancelled. This also includes a long list of infrastructural projects, for example, East Container Terminal project, which was cancelled within last three months. And so this brings us to the issue, how to go about India and Sri Lanka relations moving forward? What is the way forward so that we can resolve these issues? So moving forward, since India and Sri Lanka have close cultural ties, both countries should focus on deepening people-to-people -people contact. Apart from that, India should also insist on Sri Lanka to prioritize India's interest in defense as well as in geostrategic arena, which are non-compromisable. Then India should leverage the strength of its economic relation with Sri Lanka because we have seen that India is the largest trading partner of Sri Lanka in the South Asian region. And then, Resolving fishermen issue should be kept on priority because this is what creates a domestic pressure on both the countries. So this is it as far as India and Sri Lanka relations are concerned. You should prepare all the bilateral relations with the neighbors along the same directions by trying to highlight the area of cooperation, then trying to identify the challenging issues and then finally looking for way forward. Let us now move on to the next discussion. The clouds over silver line appears on page number seven. As all of us know, protests are taking place across Kerala against Silver Line, a semi-high speed railway project that envisages trains running at 200 km per hour between the state's northern and the southern ends. The project, estimated to cost around 63,000 crore, is billed as one of the biggest infrastructure plan in our country. So, the first thing which we should be concerned about is the areas or the regions from where this railway project is going to pass through. So, it is going to start at Kasargod, the northernmost district of Kerala, and it is going to end at Tiruvananthapuram. In the meanwhile, it is going to pass through Kannur, Kozhikode, Tirur, Thrissur, Cochin, Ernakulam, Kottayam, Chinnaganur, and Kolam. 
The proposed 529 kilometer line will link Tiruvannathapuram in the south to Kasargod in the north as you can see on the map. When the project is complete, one can travel from Kasargod to Tiruvannathapuram in less than 4 hours at 200 km per hour. Right now it takes around 12 hours. The deadline for the project being executed by Kerala Rail Development Corporation Limited is 2025 and K Rail is a joint venture between Kerala government and Union Ministry of Railways created to execute big railway projects. So when we talk about the benefits of this particular railway projects, it will help in meeting the growing demand for transport in Kerala. It will reduce the traveling time drastically from 12 hours to 3 to 4 hours. It will reduce the congestion and related accidents on road. It will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, it will integrate airports and IT corridors will lead to the expansion of roll-off and roll-on or roll-on roll-off services and it will help in creating a lot of employments. And so why are people against this particular projects? And so the opposition mainly comes from financial implications because opposition MPs from the state say that the project has an astronomical scam in making and would sink the state into debt. Then you would need to displace a lot of people in order to bring out this infrastructure, which is whooping 30,000 families. Then it would lead to a lot of toll on environment as well. The building of embankments on either side of the major portion of the line will block natural drainage and cause floods during heavy rains. The railway man of India, E. Sridharan, has termed the project ill-conceived and defectively planned. He said, the present proposal needs a lot of correction, including its basic track width. So from the perspective of prelims examination, the map locations are more important, whereas from the perspective of mains examination, the analysis of whether we need a semi-speed railway in eco-fragile region or not is more important. The next news which we have taken has appeared on page number 8, Park National Bank fined $55 million by US. So the National Bank of Pakistan yesterday reached an agreement with US regulators to pay $55 million in fine imposed on its New York branch, triggering a more than 7% drop in its shares. Pakistan, however, Pakistan is not seeing this. However, Pakistan does not expect this fine to have any impact on FATF review or Financial Action Task Force review. And so it becomes very important for us to discuss what FATF is. So as you can see, FATF is an intergovernmental body established in 1989 by a group of seven in Paris. It was formed with the intention to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering. So when we talk about the objectives, there are three clear objectives of FATF. So FATF is all about setting standards and promote effective implementation of legal regulatory and operational measures for combating not just money laundering but also terrorist financing and at the same time to counter the threats to integrity of the international financial system. At the same time, there are other key terms often used along with FATF. For example, FATF 40 plus 9. So FATF issues a report containing a set of 40 recommendations which are intended to provide a comprehensive plan of action needed to fight against money laundering. In 2001, the development of standards in fight against terrorist financing was added in the mission of FATF, thereby further adding 9 special recommendations and hence the name 40 plus 9. FATS has formed 40 recommendations against money laundering and 9 special recommendations against terrorist financing which forms commonly known terms as 40 plus 9. At the same time, FATF conducts peer reviews of each member to assess levels of implementation of FATF recommendations. It provides an in-depth description and analysis of each country's system for preventing criminal abuse of financial system. When we talk about FATF listings, FATF issues a list of non-cooperative countries or territories commonly called the FATF blacklist. These countries or territories are considered to be uncooperative in international efforts against money laundering and terrorism financing. So from the perspective of prelims examination, the question on FATF is highly expected as well as has been asked in the past. And this much information is more than sufficient to enable you to market the correct answer. Let us now move on to the question of the day.
So the question of the day for yesterday was Bagliar hydroelectric project is on which one of the following rivers? Options were Chenab, Jhelum, Kishan Ganga and Bayas and the right answer was Chenab. Whereas the question of the day for today is which of the following statement given is are correct? Statement number one, FATF is an international non-governmental body aimed at combating money laundering and terror financing. Statement two, its secretariat is located in Paris. And statement three, India is amongst its members. Choose the correct options from the code given below. A. 1 and 2 only. B. 2 and 3 only. C. 1 and 3 only. And D. 1, 2 and 3.